So we're now going to talk about a case study. We're going to walk through the code in a case study, which will demonstrate some of the features in Flowable. And in particular, we're going to apply a bunch of RxJava features that will allow us to demonstrate different types of back pressure strategies between a publisher and a subscriber that run in the context of different scheduler objects. So we're going to have one thread generating data and one thread consuming the data. And the strategies we're going to demonstrate will be missing, buffer, error, latest, and drop. So those are the things we're going to take a look at here. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. This is in the EX1 project in my Reactive Flowable folder in my Live Lessons GitHub repository. Here we are in that project in my Live Lessons GitHub repository. Let's go take a look at the source main Java package. And that's where the EX1 example lurks which will show off these different back pressure strategies. So let's take a look and see how this whole thing behaves. We're going to have a couple of atomic integers that are going to keep track of some statistics. One will be the pending item count, which is important when we're buffering stuff. And the other will be the number of items processed count. And those things will be updated concurrently, and therefore we make them atomic objects, atomic integers in this case. We parse the command line options. And this is important because you'll see that there's a bunch of options we can do here. The probably the most important one that we're going to look at is the overflow strategy. So when we look at the overflow strategy, we will see that the overflow strategy is going to be given a letter. And that will determine what overflow strategy or back pressure strategy we want to use. So drop, buffer, error, missing, and latest. So just use the letters to do that. So I'm showing you that. I'll show you how we can set that shortly. We then go ahead and start the test. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to publish a bunch of random integers. We can also, of course, control the number of integers we want to publish. And we're going to do that on a new thread. So there'll be one thread that's publishing random integers. And then in a different thread, we're going to check for primality. So let's take a look first at how we publish random integers. So here's how we do that. Publish random integers, takes in a scheduler, which as you can see will be a new thread. And that will go ahead and create us an emitter. We'll look at what this emitter does in a second. And that emitter will emit up to a certain number of random integers with a max value. And we pass in the pending count, pending item count, so we can keep track of statistics. And then we also set the overflow strategy, which is going to default to B for buffer. So we're going to buffer everything to start with. So we shouldn't lose any data. If something goes wrong, then if an exception is thrown, we're going to handle it and continue on after basically uh, logging it. And we subscribe all these operations to run on the schedule that's passed as a parameter here. Let's go take a quick look at make emitter. So here is make emitter. This is a non back pressure aware emitter, which means it's just going to blast out as quickly as it can. And to do this, we're going to say uh, emitter, which is going to be uh, what we're getting here as a parameter. Let's take just for kicks, let's go ahead and expand what emitter actually is. You can see emitter is a flowable emitter. So that I should probably just leave it like that. It's a little bit more clear. And down here, you can see we're going to generate count integers from one to count. And we're going to subscribe. And inside the subscribe operation, remember, subscribe can take multiple parameters. The first parameter is what we do when things work, when we successfully get the next item that was emitted. We're going to increment the pending items count. We're going to generate a random integer up to this max value. And we're going to Every so often, we're going to print what that value is just so we can debug this. And then if we are not canceled, we're going to publish the next item. We're going to omit the next item. If we are canceled, we will not omit because we're done. Then we pass in on error and on complete. That just says if errors or on complete events occur, pass them up the chain. And then when we're all done with this whole thing, we're going to go ahead and dispose of the stream. So that cleans up the resources that we have. So that's how we're going to make the emitter. The emitter will then start emitting those things as fast as its little heart can. 
and it'll do it in this background thread. All right, so that's what publishing random integers does. Then we're going to go ahead and take a look at check for primality. Check for primality, as you can see here. This is going to run in a different thread. We're going to run it in whatever thread we have instructed this to be. And we'll take a look at that in a second. So what the publisher, sorry, what this, this, uh, this check for primality does is it's going to go ahead and take the next number that's been emitted, because remember these emissions are coming from a background thread, it takes the next number that's emitted, and it will run that in whatever schedule we've defined there. And what it'll do in that thread context, that scheduling context, is it'll check that number to see if it's prime or not. So it's going to basically, I think it logs a diagnostic and, and returns a value. Let's take a look at this. So you can see that what check if prime does is it simply creates a new result which includes the number that we're checking for primality and then the result of checking for primality. And that just does a somewhat brute force-like mechanism to see if the number's prime. I won't walk through this, but this is how you check if a number's prime if you want to burn a lot of CPU time. And that gives us back a prime results value. And that comes back here. And then that result will be essentially put through blocking a subscribe, which is the terminal operation, which blocks. And what it does is it will call process next on normal completion. Otherwise, it'll deal with errors by printing that something failed and what the error was. And when we're all done, it prints the number of prime number checks that were completed. So let's take a quick look at process next. Process next is going to periodically print the results. And if it's a uh, if it's a prime number, sorry, if it's not a prime number, then that means that it had a smallest factor that's non-zero. It'll print out it was a, uh, not a prime number, and it'll show what its smallest factor is. Otherwise, it's going to show the prime. It'll indicate that the prime candidate was, in fact, prime. Okay, so that's basically all the steps in this example. Now let's go ahead and run it. And what you'll see is it's going to go and generate, I think it's a 1,000 numbers in the background in one thread. And you can see where the thread is running. So if you take a look here, you can see that we're going to start with a test count of 1,000. And then every 100 items, it's going to publish them. And you can see it's publishing them from a new thread that's running in the background. So 100, 200, it, it, every 100 items, it prints out what the random number is. And it also tells you how many numbers, how many items are pending to be processed. So you can see that this is growing as we go along. Now, once we start publishing, you can see that the main thread, because we just used the main thread here, is going to run and it'll check for primality. And you can see here that this number was prime. Most of the numbers were not prime, but this number was prime. And so it's going to process that. And the thing to remember is that checking for primality takes a lot longer than generating a random number. So, as you might expect, the number of items that are pending continues to grow. So by the time we get to this, when we emit the last 100 of these things, we've got a whole slew of things that are pending waiting to be processed. And because we're using the buffering model, that works fine. Let's now go ahead and go into the edit configurations part of this. And let's change the, the uh, particular strategy to be D for drop. So this is now the overflow strategy. Let's run it again. And we'll see a little different result. So now you can see what happened was we published a lot of stuff. But what's occurring here, so you can see the background thread is running and publishing, publishing, publishing. But only the first 100 or so, 128 of these things, are actually able to be processed because after that point, we're overrunning the internal buffer. And because we don't have buffer turned on, only 128 of these things can be handled. And after that point, they just get dropped. So we completed 128 prime number checks. And when we get some results here, this value was not prime. So you can see that we dropped, you know, almost, we, we dropped about 90% or so, or, you know, 87%, 88% of the numbers were dropped. 
So, and that would be dropping the latest value. If we put, uh, that'll, be drop, that'll be dropping the latest value. If we put L here, I think it'll keep the latest value, but I think we're gonna have pretty much the same results. So you can see here, once again, lots and lots of stuff is dropped, and we probably kept different values, but we only processed a subset of them. Let's come up here and try something else. Let's try E, which should throw an error when overflow occurs. So you can see here, what happens is that when we reached a point where we couldn't keep up, instead of just dropping things, it threw an exception. And it basically said we couldn't emit the value due to lack of request. That was the exception message that came through there. We still completed 128 prime checks before we ran out of internal fixed buffer space. <clears throat> and then just for kicks, let's try doing M for missing. And we'll see what we get. So M basically uh, is very similar to what we saw earlier with B for buffer. So you can see that we were able to complete 1,000 prime number checks, so it, it completed them all. I guess the main difference, and we'll go back and look at this just for kicks, is that with missing or M, notice that the results are more interspersed. So before, everything was generated and then everything was processed when we used buffer. With missing, the scheduling seems to be a little bit different. And I would need to do some more reading up on missing to remember why that is the case, but you can see it's, it will deal with things, but it, it doesn't, um, you can see that when we do buffer, everything happens, everything gets buffered, and then everything is processed after it's buffered. I think what's happening with missing is that it must be doing some kind of internal synchronization when it reaches its limit to, to somehow slow it down. But well, we'd have to check that to make sure. Okay, so that was a walkthrough of a test program that demonstrates the different strategies for doing back pressure with RxJava.